Big blow to those divisional hopes for the Indianapolis Colts. 23-20 losers in Houston. Welcome back. Colts corner Kevin Bowen, Eddie Garrison with you here as we recap week eight in the NFL. Eddie, I think you could make the statement through the first eight games of the season, the Colts are four and four, but they've lost the three most important games, uh, i.e. the two against Houston and I would call taking care of business at Jacksonville is a game that you need to take care of there. So that's what really stings right now with where you're at as a football team. Um, certainly the issues yesterday so rooted in everything you try to do throwing the football, whether that be schematically, whether that be guys getting open, whether that be protection, whether that be uh, situational awareness, play calling, et cetera, et cetera. I thought kind of a mixed bag for your defense. Um, again, we'll, we'll harp, or at least I will harp pretty harshly on the third and three decision there late in the first half. I thought kind of a sneaky play, Eddie, was Richardson on the exchange with Taylor there early third quarter when he fumbled that exchange. That was on a third down. You actually had moved it pretty well in that drive. Uh, You were in field goal range. If you're able to get a field goal there at the very least, you know that turns into a 17-13 game. Not only do you not get the field goal there, but then Houston goes on a big drive and kicks a field goal to stretch it to 10. And when it got to two scores, it just felt like that was going to be a lot to overcome. Uh, overall thoughts, general thoughts, 4-4, four and 23-20, four, and a season sweep by the Houston Texans. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, but I know it's mainly your podcast. It's not mine, so I won't air them all out completely. Starting to have a little bit of questions about the – Play caller slash head coach now, uh, which is something that I didn't think I would have to be uh, questioning. Um, and that, and if I could interject, that's dangerous. That I mean, that's that's dangerous. Like so many times, I think organizations fail their young quarterbacks. You, you know, you've got, and I would argue, you need to support this one more than any other. Just with all of the questions you had exiting Florida with him, so I think it's a fair thought. By the way. Let me go there. Um, we'll probably get to it in some way, shape, or form during Twitter questions, but that's a scary thought. Um, I'm not sure where the blame for Anthony Richardson falls on the on the categories in terms of an order for the loss yesterday. I thought your um, the players that you expect more from, I forget how you labeled those guys um, a few pods ago, um, but... Your Jonathan, or your Quentin Nelson, your Michael Pittman Jr., um, Kenny Moore. I thought all those guys had moments yesterday where it's like you're not playing like the guy that you're being paid or the side of the building guy that you um, are expected to play like. Yeah. Uh, certainly Jonathan Taylor and DeForest Buckner did show up yesterday, but I'm starting to get a little worried mainly about the head coach with the Indianapolis Colts. And I came back here, you know, I went with the Texans – uh, as my pick, and, and I certainly thought about the Colts. I, you know, I, I thought the Colts would cover. They, they actually, I changed. And I went. Covering, did you? I went Colts at the end of the last. Yeah, week. and there were several of us, you know, uh, of the people here at the station that 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 went Colts, and I didn't laugh at you guys. You know, I, 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 I was like, okay, I can definitely see it, but I do come back to this: Can this team beat a quality quarterback? You know, if you look at the list, Eddie, of the ten quarterbacks they've beaten in the last year, it's a list that will make your eyes bleed. And that's now a question I have with Josh Allen in two weeks and Jared Goff coming up at the end of the month. And again, you've already lost to Stroud twice this season. It's not like Stroud did anything extra extraordinary yesterday. I mean, he was good, I thought. I didn't think he was exceptional by any means. But Didn't turn it over, didn't have any boneheaded plays, no. and that's all you can ask for. Right, but again, the list of you know Tyler Huntley and Will Levis and Caleb Williams and Justin Fields and Aiden O'Connell and Mitch Trubisky and Baker Mayfield, Will Levis again, and Mac Jones and Bryce Young. It's just he, the mantra last week was we've got to play better, right? That was the thing. We, we, you know, you've got to play better, and the competition's going to rise. And I thought, at least for one week, as you enter the toughest month of the season, you certainly did not play better, and it was costly against a team that I think had some vulnerabilities, and I think you saw that yesterday. But yet, you couldn't take advantage of it. Uh, unless you got anything else, let's get into it. Let's dive into it, Kevin. Um, let's start into the first half. Colts backed up near their own end zone. That third and three play, Anthony Richardson on second down almost turns it over, um, and he said after the game that he checked out of whatever the play was initially called, and then he ends up throwing the pick. 
uh, to Jalen Petrie, and then that is probably the moment in the game where the game was lost for the Indianapolis Colts when you look at it um, at the end of the day. Uh, you know, Shane Steichen referenced the previous week being in a similar position. I would argue against that. Um, the Miami game, you're down 10 nothing. 10 nothing is different than 10-10. You also get the ball to start the third quarter yesterday. You didn't get the ball to start the third quarter last Sunday. I would argue 20 yards of field position difference is also a significant note. And your passing offense just had the worst first half, I would argue, in the history of the Indianapolis Colts, that passing effort. 2 of 14 at that point. Hadn't completed a third down. When the second down play happened, it was reminiscent of a 95-degree day and Max Bowen trying to eat ice cream outside and it literally almost all going over him and me <laughs> needing to be the aggressive parent in that moment and say, Max, I'm taking the ice cream from you. That's what Shane Sykin needed to do to Anthony Richardson. Instead, it was Maddie, right? Uh, no, she, certain, she just laughs at everything Max does. <laughs> um, you take the ice cream away and you try to distract him by going down the slide again. With Anthony Richardson, you take the ice cream away you run it with Jonathan Taylor. You wave the white flag. You get the ball to start of the third quarter. You regroup. Look at how they started the third quarter, Eddie. Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. Great. They ran Taylor. Then they ran a great little option play with downs. So really, that drive stalled when Pittman got the penalty. Mm-hmm. And that was a very promising drive there. Um, I thought it was offensive coordinator and not head coach enough mm-hmm. in that moment. And again, do you want situ- situational awareness from your quarterback there? Certainly. Like, yes, in an ideal world, Richardson realizes, oh my gosh, this doesn't look good, instead of checking into a play that I think could maybe get us 10 yards. Because what if Downs catches that ball? I mean, it's not like anything happens there. No. I mean, okay, so he gets, what, 10 yards on the play, and you have to take a timeout. Now you're down to one timeout, and you still have, what, 40 yards to go to get in field goal range? Oh, yeah. So I, I don't get the risk there. Honestly, if you really wanted to do something and there. And your kicker had already kissed one in from 46. Sure. If you really wanted to do something there that was aggressive, and I say that in quotes, seven man protect it and throw a 50 yard bomb to Pierce. Yep. And hope for a pass interference. Hope Pierce comes. But then if it gets picked off, it's a punt. Yeah. You know, all the way down the field. So um, I just think Shane in that moment, he's aggressive. He did it the week prior. I don't think it's apples to apples. I think you have to realize how the game flow is going. You realize, again, tie game. You get the ball to start the third. You haven't converted a third down. Your quarterback's 2 of 14. Just swallow your pride. Swallow your pride. Run it. Live to see. I. It was probably the most audible reaction I've had at a Colts play this season because I thought that was such a crushing moment of go, getting down 17-10, allowing C.J. Stroud to play with the lead. I thought your defense had delivered a pretty gutty first-half effort. Yeah, You would put them into some bad situations around midfield. You would survive that, and I just thought it gave Houston some life there. It was reminiscent to me of a bit of the Miles Garrett play from last year with Cleveland. Again, play caller, mm. not head coach. Mm-hmm. I get that that play might sound good, but when you're backup tackle and you're backed up on, the own, on, on your own goal line, sometimes you just have got to live to see another down Um, I don't think this is the best analogy but in a way you know a lot of people have said hey you know Richardson what you know checking into this and 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 all of that Eddie it was about a month ago now or probably a month and a half ago when Tua got hurt on Monday Night Football but I watched a good amount of that game was it Miami Miami Buffalo Buffalo. okay that that was why I watched it because because the Colts were playing both those teams uh, later in the season so I wanted to watch you know, a good amount of that game, and Tua was terrible in oh, that yeah. game. Terrible. Dog water. In that game. Anthony Richardson has had a very struggling stat line. I, I don't know if, you know, outright terrible, because I thought he had had some decent throws early in the first quarter, but obviously the passing offense was terrible as an operation mm-hmm. through the first, you know, 29 minutes on Sunday. What are players going to want to do? Press. Force. Create something. Hero ball. Hero ball. Perfect way to describe it. Tua tried to be a hero. He scrambled on a fourth down play of them down 21 points. Mm -hmm. Like It's like, dude, it's probably not going to end well. And unfortunately, he didn't. And I thought that was a little bit of Richardson in that moment, where as a coach, sometimes you've got to protect your player. Miami's case, that was probably a time to take Tua out of the game, frankly. And for the Colts, Shane Steichen had a moment there to do that and did not do it. So uh, I just thought, way too greedy. 
way, way too greedy. On first downs yesterday, Anthony Richardson was 3 of 10 for 20 yards. Went back to looked at that because I felt like in the first half, which ended up being true, um, they were pretty much in third and nine Gosh. or longer. That was one of the time. few third and – that was the third and three, right? That was one of the very few third and shorts. Uh, so the – yeah, the third and three was the only short yard – that was actually their shortest uh, yard to gain on third down in the first half. 0 for 6 on third down conversions. 10, 13, 10, 10, 8, and 3 were the yards that the Colts needed to get. Um, in the second half, it was different at the, at the start – Four yards to gain, eight yards to gain, 23, 6, 10, 13, and 10. Um, I already read off Richardson on first down, three of 10 for 20 yards. On third downs, two of eight, 35 yards. Both those completions coming on that touchdown drive the Colts had where he had the 11-yarder to Alec Pierce and then the 24-yarder uh, to Josh Downs inside the one-yard line that was just shy of the goal line. Those were their only two third down uh, conversions in the day. Interception fumble on the awkward exchange between him and Taylor and then was sacked three times. Why are the Colts pass catchers always more covered than the other team's pass catchers? Uh, it's because they struggle to get open. I mean, that. do you not, am I the only one that has that thought? No. I mean, like, I, and early on in the game, again, and we'll get into this more and things that I didn't like, but like, you know, EJ Speed and Jalen Jones have those great pass breakups on the first drive. Um, I'm like, oh man, this is I mean, this is the sort of secondary playmaking or passing game playmaking you didn't get in week one. And that was the last time a Colts defender touched a CJ Stroud pass the rest of the game. So it's like, why are they so much more open than the Colts? So this gets the passing game operation, Eddie. Schematically. I was about to say, is it like concepts or is it just the guy's not getting open or is what it is it? Separation, Michael Pittman Jr. I mean, if you look at the target and catches since he suffered this back injury, it's an ugly number, especially for a guy that's not a big play wide out. Um, you obviously had some drops yesterday. You can't ignore that. Moments of truth. Uh, I think other teams just make more contested catches than the Colts, frankly, do. Uh, and I thought it was your worst O-line protection of the year. Uh, five sacks for Richardson is a big old number. Big old number. Um, so I thought all of that was an issue. Um, and, and again, they're missing their two starting linebackers. I thought you could have taken advantage of maybe the middle of the field and you honor national tight end day with, I believe, Oon catch. In the 70-plus snaps. That Kylan that, Granson for four yards, right? That quartet played, yes. Kylan Granson, Will Mallory had, had a drop. So I just thought your entire passing offense was at fault. Because, again, there will be certainly people that will point to Richardson's day and say, hey, he wasn't as inaccurate as it looks. And, like, I can hear you out. Like, it's not like he had the air mails that hit D'Amico Ryans or the ground balls. Like, they, there maybe weren't that. But what's the separation issue, Eddie? Is it he should throw with more anticipation because there are windows? You just got to anticipate the windows? Mm -hmm. Or is he waiting too long and now the window's closed? Or our guy's not creating separation? You know, it's just, it's all of those things that are questions right now for your passing offense. Um, And to me, it was a multi pronged uh, issue on Sunday. Um, So that was such a big, big problem of consistently living in the third and longs. I mean, when you got to halftime, he was 2 of 15, and the 2 was a screen to Taylor and a Josh Downs busted coverage. Yep. I mean, that was it. I mean, that's just just wild. And now, I, I did think in the second half you were better. I mean, he had the ball to, to Goodson that could have should have been caught. He had the great ball to Downs. That was a hell of a catch by Downs. Downs is your MVP here at the midway point of the season. Um, downfield just great yesterday, but still you're just you're just playing with too much fire. And I thought your O line, you know, I tweeted out they got the ball back what with like two two fifty right after the Dio play, right? Like like yeah. two fifty or something, two thirty to go, two timeouts, ample time. Time is really of no issue. And what happens? Your offensive line just gets smoked. Nelson has a false start penalty. How many false start penalties did Nelson have? Three. I mean, like again, some of this stuff is just inexcusable from those frontline guys. So, uh, Eddie, I thought your passing operation yesterday very, very poor. Richardson in the second half uh, was what eight of seventeen? Is that sound right? Yeah, eight of seventeen. Yeah, two of fifteen in the first. So yeah, that is ten of thirty-two. I, I'm starting to struggle with how many times can I sit here on a Monday morning, Eddie, and say. The box score won't show up, but he was a lot better than that. 
it's just it, it, it's starting to become difficult. Do I think there's important context that we try to lay out on this pod each and every week? Yes. But at some point, historic games that continue to happen in the negative manner, the leader of that operation is largely at fault. It's, I mean, right now, I mean, if you look at Kansas City, they're playing all these games where I swear I look at it in the fourth quarter and they're losing or it's like tied, and yet they win all of them. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, they've got people that have been there and done that and they make enough plays. And right now with the Colts, it's just, especially with the offense and the passing offense in general, it's the opposite of that. So do I think it's difficult to scheme around such an accuracy? Yeah, at times. But again, I didn't think it was a perfect day by any means with other position groups around Richardson. So um, it's just all, you know, I actually did this exercise yesterday. I went back and looked at some of the stories I wrote post Florida, you know, late April, early May last year. What are the questions we have of Richardson? Mm -hmm. And all none of them have a positive answer right now. I mean if you big plays, I guess, that is something like I think you've shown in the NFL you can do. Yeah. But like if you start to parse out the and again I go to situational awareness from yesterday. Why didn't he get out of bounds on that scramble on the final drive? Yep. That is a great first play of a final drive. If you ask anybody, any quarterback that's been in those moments, they always harp on getting the first first down is the hardest. Yeah. Getting out of the blocks. He doesn't just get out of the blocks. He has a 22-yard play. If that scramble is 20 yards and he gets out of bounds, not only do you stop the clock, but, and we'll get to this in Twitter questions, Richardson can catch his breath. Yeah. And again, I know that might sound like a ludicrous statement, but obviously we saw that yesterday. Go back to the Green Bay game. Remember Green Bay when he scrambled and he was kind of kneeling in the huddle? Like, yeah, like late, late in the game. I mean, yeah. we, we we've seen a form of Richardson like needing to catch himself on the field before. I thought you saw it a little bit in Miami too in the fourth quarter toward the end when they started running him a little bit more. Yeah, on yeah, that yeah, drive yeah. that led to the field goal. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. He he, he kind of laid or he was on the ground for a little bit more than maybe I than you know whatever. Some guys just pop up a little bit quicker on that. So like the, that is a situational awareness moment. I thought is. I thought his post-game comments were odd. Um, again, we'll get more into the he was tired in just a second, but um, I don't know. I would have liked a little bit more self-accountability after the game. You have anything uh, else you want to add into the passing offense? No, what you didn't no, like? no, no. Okay. I'm done. Transition now to what you did like. Let's get some positive. Let's get some good vibes going in here. Uh, Jonathan Taylor and DeForest Buckner made their returns, and they were both fantastic yeah, from they, the time the game started. They played like they're on the side of Lucas Oil Stadium. Outstanding. Only two um, guys that really showed up on that in that aspect, right? Uh, sure, very, very, very accurate there. Uh, Taylor Spry, the cutting, the lateral stuff, all of it was there. Twenty for one hundred and five. Uh, no real pitch count. Eighty-one percent. I mean, that's that's pretty normal. For- made, yeah, it made me wonder when I was watching that game yesterday and seeing how often he was on the field. I was like, could he have gone last week and they just held him out because they felt mm-hmm. like they could win and give him an extra week to get healthy and be ready for a divisional opponent? Yeah, but I, I just thought just so good. Um, Love the screen. You know, I thought he created something there that really wasn't there on top of it. So, Taylor, really good. Buckner, I thought Buckner would probably be more on the third down pitch count, but no, he played 60 some percent, which isn't quite at the level he usually is at. He's usually, you know, hovering around 80, but still, he he played a good amount. And I thought that hit he had on Stroud early was going to be one we circled all the game long. Oh, yeah. Uh, Four minutes ago in the first quarter, he smoked him, and Stroud was feeling it. And it got up super slow. Then they threw a screen the very next play. Um, but Stroud, I mean, kudos to him for kind of gutting it out through that. Buckner had the big sack to knock him out of field goal range as well. So, outstanding. Uh, I thought I saw a note that Buckner had, like, the highest pass rush win rate of anybody in the early games on Sunday. Mm-hmm. And that was the entire NFL. So, Buckner and Taylor, they not only played, they played a lot, and they played like the pro bowlers that they are. I want to add someone else into this because I thought he was fantastic all game, and I thought you noticed him a lot too. Um, Dio Adango had a phenomenal game. I know the box score, he only had one more tackle than DeForest Buckner, but he still had a sack. He had three tackles for loss, and he got three quarterback hits yesterday. And, of course, he um, he was there at the right place at the right time and was able to somehow uh, – Put the football uh, against his helmet, recover it there to give the Colts some life and a you know a glimmer of hope in the end of the game when they needed it. Yeah, I thought Dio in general. Um, I was really curious how he would play throughout that you know whole 
Buckner absence. Uh-huh. A contract year for him. And I thought he's had a moment or two. I selfishly, I would have liked a little bit more. But to your point, I, I I did think he was pretty effective yesterday. And certainly, he blows up that play and you know almost you know totally changes the the complexion of that game. But I think this kind of gets into my next point, Eddie. Of the other thing I liked was I think the defense. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. Is that so, a question? Yeah, I think it is. So help me out on this. All right. What I say earlier, they were thrown in some really bad situations in the first half. Uh-huh. I mean, several drives right there at midfield, great Houston field position, and no points. Yeah. Outstanding. I thought the pass rush, similar to week one, was pretty good. Uh-huh. They, they uh, hit Stroud nine times, two sacks, maybe a little bit more I was looking for in the in the second half, but still, I thought pretty good there. Where I just can't go full, and this is where I hedge, is... It was the worst passing offense in the NFL without Nico Collins. They lose Stephon Diggs in the third quarter, and yet they still throw for 285. And then I mentioned EJ Speed and Jalen Jones getting their hands on two balls on that first drive. The next 31 attempts for C.J. Stroud, not one hand on him. Not one hand on any of those balls. And again, how many times are the Colts having contested catches against them? Um, Second and 16 from the two-yard line. Turns into a field goal. Second and 19, without Collins, without Diggs, turns into a field goal. Mix and runs for over 100. I just, it's low on the blame list. There's a reason we're 20-some minutes on this podcast, and I'm just now getting to it. But I, I don't know. I just thought, the, I thought it was a mixed bag from the defense. Would you feel differently? And feel free if, I'm, if you think I'm being overly critical. Would you feel differently if they don't pitch it to Mix and it's a run and Houston ends up scoring there instead of the fumble at the end of the game. Yeah, I'd probably be more critical. And look, if you want to look at the point total, it's what, 23 points? Because, I mean, they were at the Colts' eight-yard sure, line when sure, that happened. Sure. But again, cre- I mean, credit credit's a die. I mean, that, I mean, Mixon had run all over you, or had, I thought, was really getting going, and had another 100-yard day against you, but you made a play there. I mean, they allowed 23. You know, you could easily say, wait a minute, they allowed 16 because, you know— you have that turnover there late in the first half. Now, yeah. you know, you would like in a 17 second moment, I know it's greedy, but you'd like to not allow that touchdown there. Yep. Uh, certainly, that was a huge, huge sequence, kind of the uh, cherry on top there for Houston. The but, tackling effort on the t- on the touchdown drive where uh, yeah, Joe tackling, Mixon got in was horrible. Just a real shoddy. Run defense continues to be the most disappointing aspect to the 2024 Colts. So, I, I, think the defense was okay, but now that I've just talked it out, I kind of regret even putting it in the light category. Um, I, and look, I mean, Phil, I just don't think this is the C.J. Stroud Texans offense of week one. I mean, Nico Collins is a huge loss. And they lost to Fun Diggs. A 160-yard difference with Nico in the lineup versus Nico not in the lineup. Yes. And when Diggs goes out, and I know that was kind of deep in the third quarter, but still, they convert a second and 19 after that. They're able to make some plays there late with Mixon um, to kind of help ice that game or at least eat up a lot of clocks. So, um, And again, just zero playmaking in the secondary after that first drive. I thought the Kenny Moore flag was a little weak. I thought CBS in general was pathetic yesterday with their replays. I mean, so many plays. I said, give me another look, Yep, and none of it. Uh, the Hutchinson catch, um, I thought they could have done a better job on the pass interference penalty by Pittman. I don't know. I just thought I thought the Kenny one deserved a little bit more of a look. I thought it was a weak call. Yeah, I um, I thought the special teams unit was pretty much on the field by the time the flag was thrown. Right. I thought the timing was. Again, I, I would agree with you. I thought it was a weak call. I know that that right arm, right hand that you know guys put behind defenders' backs, that can get a little bit. Um, gray area E, but I usually trust Kenny <laughs> more I was about than say, most. I, and then, like additionally here, I didn't know Hutchinson had the cachet to ask for a flag and get, and have it thrown. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so yeah, I I thought you know the Colts have gotten a pretty good whistle. Honestly, this season I thought yesterday they did not get as good a whistle. We haven't talked about Anthony Richardson a ton. It's because he's in a lot of our Twitter questions. You ready for those, Kev? Let's do it. Starting with Josh. Either way, they're lying about Anthony Richardson when he came out in the game. In which the case they really need a better lie than, quote, he was tired after running three straight plays, or they aren't lying, and they should have. <laughs> Eddie, I um, I really appreciate Anthony Richardson's honesty. 
I really do. But damn, you gotta lie. You gotta lie there. It's just um The part that gets me is like he's kind of fighting back a grin. You look at the start of that. Yeah, I I, I like, in yeah. general again, I didn't love the post game from him. Um I try not to be overly critiquey of those sorts of things. Um I think it's difficult, but uh, yeah, I, I I didn't love that. But let's let's focus on the tired play. Okay. Okay. First off, he sheds a 318-pound defensive tackle. Unbelievable effort to get back to the line of scrimmage. Agreed. Um, and, you know, he rather quickly taps the helmet. So I don't think he had in his mind, hey, I know this is going to be a third down give up call of third and a million here, third and goal. It's just going to be a handoff. I have, um, I've never seen a quarterback do that. I've never seen a running centric quarterback do that. I think that's worth mentioning as well. Like of Lamar Jackson and Josh Allen and those guys, I've never seen them yeah. do that. Certainly you see skill players do that at times. You see defensive linemen asked to be taken out, but quarterback is different. It is just different. Um and it kind of adds to the list of situational awareness that I've mentioned on a couple of occasions today. And this is a different form of situational awareness, but you know when I went back and read those stories that I wrote back in last spring about okay, what does Richardson need to prove at the NFL level? One of the you know headlines that I put was like, can you handle the moment of being an NFL quarterback? It's a lot that goes with it, mm-hmm. a lot. And part of it is a responsibility of like, you just can't check yourself out for a play because you're tired. Yep. Like I I. I what kind of message does that send that to the locker room? Yeah, it's just, and again, guys look to you because you are the quarterback. You have the C on the chest, all of those things. And so it is different, and you just don't see quarterbacks do that at all. Um, now, in the grand scheme of important plays in the game, he literally checked himself out of one of the more meaningless plays of the entire game. I mean, Flacco, third and goal from yeah, the 23, right? right? So Flacco hands it off, but it's just a. Um, Optically, it's just really, really poor. Um, I mean, this is your biggest game of the season. I would argue it was one of the more at-state games Anthony Richardson's ever played in his career. And you do that. It just And like Steichen tried to say he had run it on three straight plays. I mean, no, he hadn't run it on three straight plays. So I don't, I didn't necessarily follow all of that. So... Yeah, I mean, at first I was like, oh, I'm looking forward to watching a replay. Maybe the hit was awkward. Maybe he – I mean, hell, I, <laughs> would you rather him say that he aggravated his hip injury or, <laughs> or would you rather him say that he was tired in that play? I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that. But it's just a – um, it's a poor, poor look. And there are enough questions about Anthony Richardson's play that it's difficult, Eddie, to now have questions about him – as a quarterback, whether it is taking himself out in that play, whether it's not getting out of bounds late in the game, whether it's him dropping, you know, a a snap or an exchange. It seemingly happens like once a week now where there's some sort of fumbled exchange. Like those are the questions we can't have. Like (laughs) we don't have time for that stuff. It's week eight. We've got, well, yes, but like there are so many other questions with him about his health, about his accuracy, about like, like those are the questions we need to focus on. We we, we can't be focusing on, are you getting out of bounds? Are you handling snaps? Are you not coming out of the game because you're tired? Like those are questions that you just can't have. So again, I am not questioning the toughness of Anthony Richardson, I think he takes a lot of hits. I think he attacks defenders quite often. Um, I don't need to be proven of that. It's just more of optically guys in that locker room I think are largely going to be bothered by Oh, yeah. And um, when you are an NFL quarterback, you're held to a different standard. Right or wrong? I would argue right because look at the money you make and you touch the the football in every single play. So, um, yeah. I probably won't make too much more of a deal about it. I don't think it needs to be talked about maybe too much more, um, but those are my thoughts. I was just saying it's week eight. Those types of things shouldn't be happening. You're you're at the at the halfway point, essentially, and you can't be making those silly turnovers or those silly plays like that. Like how often do you see other quarterbacks making those mistakes 
yeah. this point in the year. Yeah, it was, you know, when you're going to be so feast or famine, you can't contribute to more of that. And I feel like he's contributed to more of that. And, and frankly, they were lucky that they pounced on that fumble there and Houston didn't get it at, at midfield. Chris and Flippin would like to know, when will Shane Steichen realize his game plan for Anthony Richardson so far is not working? He's not calling enough plays to benefit AR in his skill set. Too many deep passes, plus Jonathan Taylor was having a great game, and they still didn't run the ball enough. Yeah, I thought the Taylor, again, Taylor, uh, pitch count-wise, you know, he, he played a normal amount. I, I would have liked to have seen him a little bit more earlier in the game. I certainly hear you out on that. Um, you know, RPO specifically, Richardson is a much more efficient thrower of the football out of that mm-hmm. than he is other plays. So I do think that needs to be a staple more. You know, honestly, we poke phone at the... I poke fun at the you know tight end usage or production I should say of yesterday like that grants and dump off those are simple plays that need to be more there. You can't just live in these third and longs. Nope. I mean it is playing with fire. It's exposing your offensive line. It's obviously exposing Richardson as well as great of a deep ball thrower as he is. He, you know he sits in that pocket. He feels like he can make the play, make the play, make the play, and you know you're going to have these moments where guys are going to sack him from behind, and now that risks ball security and all of that. So. It's just an offense right now that is living seemingly solely on the legs of Taylor or a deep ball from Richardson. And you have got to get into more third and short, third and manual situations where his legs are a weapon. Yeah. You know, you just, when you get into the third and longs, the legs just aren't as serious of a threat there. So two design runs yesterday, by the way. Two. Oh, a week after he had had so many design runs, you know? And, and so that was what was confusing on, on top of that as well. When they're missing their two linebackers. You know, I thought that was an area where you could expose them. Oh, yeah. And that was an area of probably why I kind of was like, uh, am I smart in picking the Texans here? Um, so, yes, I think Shane Steichen certainly needs to be better. Rodney states, Anthony is now not only inaccurate, but he also admitted checking into the idiotic interception late in the first half. Then for the first time in my 47 years of watching football, tapped out for a breather on third down in plus territory forget the development aspect now for a second how much more of this before there is a full-on mutiny in the locker room used to at least say the right things but now quotes like ain't gonna lie i was tired and quote i checked into the play because i thought i could fit it into josh have me seriously wondering if he's even got the mental makeup to be qb1 talk me off the ledge boys Rodney, that comment right there, the mental makeup to be QB1, you know, what I think you like about Richardson is I think there's a good amount of work ethic. I think he's rather poised as a quarterback and, like, you don't get really deer in headlightsy when it gets chaotic in front of you. You know, a lot of guys, I think, just panic, and I don't see that from him. But still, there's a lot more. And I thought yesterday was such... If you want to be glass half full about yesterday, he was put into situations I would say he has not been put into very often in his NFL career. Yeah. Now... Uh, less than two minutes or whatever, or a little over two minutes, no timeouts, go win the game. Right. So you got two of those. Or tie it up. Yesterday. Now, again, he failed, and the offense failed in virtually all of those situations. But, again, he is exposed to them, and he needs to be exposed to them. Um, but, like... To Rodney's point, I mean, it's bad because these are all the things that go into playing quarterback. It kind of goes into my question to you last week I, when we were talking about like RPOs and the lack of like the easy hitters. Is Shane Steichen just saying, hey, you got to go out there and learn how right. to be an actual quarterback? So we're going to make you make all the checks at the line of scrimmage, make all the reads of coverage before, and then identify it post snap and trying to make you into a pocket passer, which. He's not. Yeah, and again, of all the questions that we had exiting Florida, all of that is true. I mean, all, all of those things I would laugh are, I, I I would argue are are growing and they're real, and we're starting to get into breaking points for some people. Is and he I get one that. of them? Say it again. Is he one of them? Well, I, I I think that's a fair question to ask of like, are you breaking him by playing him? You know, that's what some people think. Hey, when you play these quarterbacks early, you're risking breaking them and then they can't recover. I 
um, of the thought with Richardson is he was so inexperienced as a college quarterback, you had to play him. Mm-hmm. You have to play him. He he. I mean, Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix. I mean, you see how much they played in college. Yes. You know, it just pales in comparison to Richardson. Uh, but I understand. I think the Colts should stick with Richardson. I think, yeah, you know, I think I've made that pretty clear. But I can listen to the people that question that thought certainly, uh, because the arrow is pointing downward. Um, the questions are only growing. Um, it's difficult to say how many times are we going to say the box score won't show it, but he it was a lot better than that. I mean, all that stuff is difficult. But like I watched yesterday's second half, and I think okay, there are. I would say more than a few flashes in there. Like someone called into our show this morning and said, well, if Flacco started the second half, the Colts would have won the game. And I would disagree with that. I mean, that was a 17 fo- 17-10 football game at halftime. These were the Colts' drives after halftime. The first drive, we talked about it. You get into field goal range, Michael Pittman has the holding penalty. Yeah. You stall out. Yes, Richardson drops the snap, but still, that, that, that Pittman holding penalty is big. So you have to punt. The next drive, you get a field goal out of that. Nice drive. Um, I believe they took the touchdown off the board. That was the... Uh, Pierce touchdown. You had to settle for a field goal there. Mm-hmm. Um, Pittman, so, ironically again. Right. So that was your second drive. Your third. You only have five drives in the second half. Your third drive was a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Goodson drops it. He comes back, throws another great ball to Downs, and you score there. So obviously that's a great drive. Your fourth drive was the offensive line getting wrecked. Three plays. He sacked. Uh, Nelson has a false start. That was with 250 to go or 230 to go. Mm-hmm. So your old line just totally fails you. And then the last drive, of course, is the Hail Mary attempt that never gets off. So you had really four real drives. I think you kind of throw out that final drive. I mean, that was a tough situation to be thrown into. Two of four are scoring drives. One that didn't score, I would argue the Pittman holding penalty took you out of that. Pittman or uh, Richardson compounded it with dropping the snap. And then the other one was a three and out where I thought your O line just was under siege. Mm -hmm. So again, like if Flacco starts. Do you all of a sudden turn that into five touchdown drives? Like, no, I, I don't I don't think that happens there in the second half. And speaking of situational awareness, it might seem like a little thing, but I didn't like how Richardson handled the Hail Mary. Me either. I, like the, Again, these are all things that it's like, it's so difficult for a fan, and certainly we're not used to this as a franchise, Eddie. Nope. That we have to watch this type of quarterback learn and fail on the job. I mean, that is... That's tough to watch for a fan. It is indeed. And so, like, I don't discredit. Again, Maddie asked me several times, like, should we go to Flacco? Uh, you know, and I'm like, I'm not. Like, I thought AJ Ross should have asked Steichen that question at halftime. Now, again, I thought you stick with Richardson, but I think the question is fine to be asked right now. Of like a, hey, do you sit at your building at all, and do you think, guys, should we sit him? Does he watch Flacco in a two minute drive on the sideline say? Oh wow, he really handled the clock well. Maybe next time I should get out of bounds. Late in a half, when the half's struggling and it's a third and three, does Flacco come over the sideline and say, "Hey man, dude, I just thought let's just throw up the white flag." I know we get the ball start the third quarter. This passing offense can't move. I know it's kind of a loser play, but we'll take ten ten going into halftime. Right. Or does he have to experience it on the field? Do you learn better reading a book, or do you learn better being in the field? Yeah. Like, that's the question that I think is very – and this is, this goes for 32 NFL teams. But as a Colts franchise, we haven't lived it. So that's why I think it's so jarring to watch and to witness. Um, I still think he's got to have the reps. But, you know, Rodney brings up a couple post-game comments. I didn't – again, I didn't I didn't, I didn't, didn't love it post-game. And, and I'm not one that's usually, I think, overly critical of those situations. But I didn't love it. Three questions left, Brett, Conroy, I'll add one more, sorry. And Brian. Let me add one more. Richardson checking into the interception there late. Mm-hmm. That To me, that goes back to Shane saying, we're running out with JT. No checks, none of it. I'm protecting you. I'm protecting our football team. We're throwing the white flag. Yep. You, you, you don't put your, again, the player is pissed of how the first 28 minutes have gone. Uh-huh. The player wants to make a play. Yep. The player Here's all the criticisms. Yep. He's on social media. He knows the questions that are asked of him weekly. He gets that he hasn't been on the field as much as he would like to through the first year and a half. Yes, you would like for your quarterback to have situational awareness in that moment. But that's also a lot to put on, I thought, a player that had some immature moments on Sunday. 
Brett states, probably a hot take, but I was pretty happy with today. Richardson looks considerably more accurate, but multiple receivers had an awful time catching the football today. Opportunities like that drive at the end of the first half and at the end of the game might look bad, but if Anthony Richardson is going to learn, that's what will eventually have to happen. Tell me I'm not just coping at this point, KB. <laughs> <laughs> Richardson got exp- I would make the argument Eddie yesterday might have been the best 60 minute exposure he's gotten in his NFL career. Yeah, I'd probably agree with that, yeah. I mean, he, it's a road game, it's a divisional opponent, he's seen him for the second time. There's a lot at stake. He's playing the quarterback that's his boy that's kind of run his mouth a little bit, understandably. But yet he gets all these great chances late half, late game, he's got to bounce back, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all of it like you know, I guess if you want to be like uber optimistic, the misses aren't sailing into the crowd and they're not ground balls. But again, this goes back to the question why are their pass catchers more open than the Colts? Is that anticipation? Is that personnel? Is that scheme? What is it? So I thought the play design for the uh, Josh Downs touchdown was brilliant. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. You get the double crossers right, and. Right. You I get mean, the DB that runs right into Alec Pierce, and you know Richardson hits him. Yeah, I mean, how do you how do you look at the Goodson one? You know, <laughs> you look at that and say great design, or don't throw the ball to him. You know, yeah. Um, so I think that's something that you have to look at as well. So, um, Brent, I I can hear you out. If you are all in on the this is a three year trial, then I could listen to the what great unscripted situational moments he got yesterday. I can listen to that. But I also think we shouldn't ignore the other side of it. And the other side of it is the arrow is pointing down as he reaches the midway point of year two. And honestly, a roller coaster is probably unfair. What's the ride at? Is it Cedar Point that just goes straight down? Never been to Cedar Point, so I have no idea. Maybe it's Kings Island. One of those, it goes straight down. Diamondback? I know that one goes pretty much straight down, yeah. That's the Richardson experience right now. Yeah. Roller coaster has uh, has highs and lows. Right now, the Richardson experience is almost just going straight down. Yeah. So, yeah, the old roller coaster analogy, oof, I don't know if I can even go there. Conroy wonders, if you're Chris Ballard, when do you dictate to Shane that Jim Bob is the new offensive play caller? The play calling through the first half, this is being written at halftime, has been one of the worst I have seen since Frank Reich. This isn't the first game where offensive play calling has been laughable, mind you. Um, yeah, I think we've certainly hit on, you know, where things are at from a Shane standpoint. Now, secondly, I don't think that that should be a Chris Ballard call. Um, I mean, but if you aren't letting Shane call plays, then why hire him as the head coach? That's, I mean, that's. I mean, you hired him because of what he did with Justin Herbert, what he did with Jalen Hurts. I mean, that more or less, that's why you hired. You knew quarterback was going to be such a critical point of your organization, of your franchise's future. So you make that hire. Um, so that would be where I would kind of pause on that here. I just felt like there weren't a lot of runs in the first half, and it just felt like everything was, like I highlighted earlier, it was third and long. Yeah, you lived way too much in that third and long. So in the first half, Richardson had 15 passes, Taylor had eight runs. I guess Taylor and Richardson combined, you had 10 runs to 15 passes. And I guess two sacks, so that would have been 10 runs to 17 pass attempts. I wonder how many of those Richardson runs were actually scrambles. I'd have to look at that one. Right. And then again, how much of that is just, you just get, you know, they just got behind the chains routinely. It's like you, you've got to have some of the easier non-sexy throws <laughs> you do screens screens are just you know dumps to a tight end here dumps to a tight end there i mean i know pitman's dealing with the back but even those pitman screams that sometimes would go for four or five because when you can get into third and threes now all of a sudden that defense is like hey you got richardson you, like you, you know who, who's got his legs we're third and nine third and ten you're not as living it and the, and the inter- interesting thing about richardson is the poise word was used to describe him when he exited Florida. Yeah. What that indirectly means is he does not look to run as much as you would think he looks to run. Right. You would think one that is so gifted 
athletically and as a runner would look to run more. He does not. Mm-mm. I mean, if you watch him, that is a man that wants to throw the football, which is certainly a slippery slope when you're as poor of a thrower as he is. Right now, yeah. It, it, it makes it for difficult. So, again, that this gets into awkward moments, Eddie. You're Shane Steichen, and you say to me, Anthony Richardson, hey, man, you need to take off more. You know, he he threw that deep ball to Pierce, right? And it went incomplete, mm-hmm. and I think he had some. By the way, Houston, I thought, played the deep ball fairly well yesterday. They didn't get too panicky down the field. Then you run there. Well, then what happens when he tries to run over Jalen Petrie, and now Petrie hits him and he's out? Right. Yeah, I mean, like, this gets into the awkward nature to all of that. So, um, this is a – the Colts are 4-4. Four and four. If you want optimism, the playoff picture provides that. Trust me, just analyze it. There are tons of teams that are already out of it. I wanted to preface all that by saying it's an awkward moment to be a Colts fan. It is. It's a difficult moment to be a Colts fan. Now you're entering the toughest stretch of your season right now, too. Toughest stretch of the season. And again, if you want optimism, look at the wild card picture. You can find it. Should we circle the Denver game right now as the biggest game of the season? Because I mean, cause that, I mean that, that's what it's shaping up to be. Cheer for the Giants tonight. But like, if you want to look at the AFC right now, you could make a case it's nine teams for seven spots. Right. I mean, right. if you if you really want to look at it, you know, yesterday the Colts got great one, one o'clock help. The Jets doing Jets things. The Dolphins losing late. The Bengals losing to the Eagles. You know, all those things. But you got Cleveland beating uh, Baltimore. Cleveland beating Baltimore. Those were big results, but it is just a weird moment for this franchise. Another Ballard directed question to close out today's pod from Brian: If the Colts would have picked Anthony Richardson first overall in that draft, I have questions about the Colts. Draft grades. They picked the guard sixth overall that has had numerous penalties this year, and they picked the quarterback that quit on his team and pulled himself out because he was tired. Well, I can probably speak for all of Colts fans that we are tired of waiting. Time to move on from Chris Ballard and company. I can hear it now. The Colts have traded the eighth pick for the 25th pick in a future third rounder. Chris Ballard loves his picks that don't work out. Should Richardson have lied post game? Well, it didn't help that Shane Steichen told Lara Overton on radio the same thing. So I mean, right? Yeah, I guess at that point it's like, it was already out. So, <laughs> oh man, I I cringed hard when he said that out loud. I cringed hard. Um, yeah, I. I when you go band aid like they went for so many years, you continue to add risk onto your situation. And this is the real risk of it. And, and you know, you can make the argument as intriguing and oozing and moldable clay as Anthony Richardson is and was out of Florida, there also was a lot of risk involved in it. CJ Stroud, a man that Eddie Garrison certainly adored throughout the draft process. Uh, pretty low risk, pretty high floor, and I think you are seeing that. Um, so yeah, boy, this is a critical juncture, man. Are you surprised they're a touchdown underdog to the Vikings? Not at all. Really? Not at all. Road game, and the Colts haven't looked good offensively, and Minnesota's defense has um, been solid with Flores this year. But um, yeah, I, just, I thought that Darisau injury is a big one. He's out for the year. And I just feel like Minnesota hasn't looked great the last it'll be, couple weeks. That'll be a big one for this aspect because they lead the NFL in blitzes and blitz percentage. Oh, Flores is exotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Flores is – oh, yeah. I mean, you want to talk about a great moment for Richardson? Coming up Sunday night. They're going to have to do draws or screens or something on on yeah. Sunday night simply because of that aspect. Like Big, big, it's big. Like you counter it, right? He's Eddie Garrison. I'm Kevin Bowen. Eight and eight, or excuse me, four and four, uh, week eight. Maybe that's where my mind was going. Colts in prime time, Sunday night football against Minnesota. We'll break it down for you on Wednesday's pod. Everybody have a great week.